start with, I'm going to start at the end of Philippians, just with one verse, not completely at the end, but in just about towards the end. And I'm going to do a, something I've, I haven't done for a while. I'm going to do a series on this. Uh, and I'm going to do a series on this, this title right here, He Strengthens Me. And, and I'm going to start right at the end with one scripture, and then I'm going to go back, start through one, chapter one, and go through the whole thing because there's so much in there. And then on Sundays, I'm going to use, I'm going to go into Ephesians and I'm going to go into that scripture that, that he's, he's able to do anything that we can even imagine or think to ask. And I'm going to do a series on Ephesians on Sundays and a series on Philippians on Fridays. And see where it goes. I don't know how long they're going to be. Sometimes they go three. Sometimes Last time I did a series, it was six parts. And I started out, that time I started out with one. I was just doing one thing and it just started to build. And so I went, I went on that. So I'm going to do that in the next little while. So Father, I need your help right now in the name of Jesus to start this off correctly, Lord. Father, I just pray that any hindering thoughts that are going through our heads right now, that, that I just break that off in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I break that off and I, I, I command it to go right now in Jesus' name. So even the fact that I'm wearing a rider sweater, if that's throwing you off, you need to get that out of your head right now. Amen? Amen. I preached on Saturday at Saskatoon and camouflage stuff and nobody said a word about that, the camel. Everybody was just in love with Jesus. You know, it was just an incredible thing. I... I just do that as camouflage for the devil. Like the hair, all that stuff is just camouflage. The devil can't see me coming. So all that stuff, you know, in, in Jesus' name. And so, I know my thought and theories and stuff like that are a little whacked, but I, I think they're good. But. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. And I'm going to start in a... Oh, put that quote of the day back up. I just got to see that just because I want to end with that again, but I want to start with it. Um. <laughs> there we go. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Jim Elliott, a tremendous missionary who got actually killed doing what he was called to do. And uh, amazing story, if you, what's it called, End of the Spear? It's a book, there's a book you can get, and there's a video, there's a movie on it. It, it happened a long time ago, and it's amazing. These guys, all these missionaries went into this place in Africa. Uh, or no, where was it? No, uh, Ecuador, right, Ecuador. And, and they went into this place, and these, these, these guys, they, they just killed people whenever they came there. And um, I remember Jim, was it Jim Elliott? Was it Jim Elliott was sitting with his son and they, in the movie and, and he said, they said, Daddy, are you going to shoot them if they come at you? And he says, no, we can't. We can't. He says, we're ready for heaven and they're not, so we can't kill them. So if they come at us with spears, we have to take it. They went in knowing that they were going, good chance they were going to get killed. And they did. But the wives went back in, and the whole thing got, the whole, the whole tribe got saved. It was an, it's an amazing story. And so that's one of his quotes. You know, you, you got to be willing to give up what you cannot keep in order to gain that which you cannot lose. And that's eternal life, right? Amen? And so the, the, the temporal stuff is what we have to give up. If it's hindering us from keeping, getting to know Jesus, then we need to give up a lot of this stuff. A lot of our thoughts, a lot of our thought process, everything. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13 says, I am, Paul says, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. And in the Amplified, it says, in the same verse, it says, I have strength. For all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. It's powerful. 
And we like to use that scripture a lot. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And when you think of this now, when Paul was writing this letter, he was writing it from a Roman prison cell. You know, he penned this, it's a love letter to the church in Philippi. And this, this letter, um, it, describes, it describes the godly character of Paul and the Philippian church. And they had a great love for one another. Just, they just, you, when you read this book and when you begin to read everything in context, you see that Philippians 4.13 started in chapter 1. He's building up to get that phrase in right there. He's building up to something that was tremendously powerful. But it started, doesn't we, we, we look at that, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things, we, we say that over and over and over. And there is a process to everything. Paul had to go through a process, say process, before he could actually say something like that. Had to go through a process before he had the ability to even say it. He just didn't wake up one morning and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's hard to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me when you haven't done nothing. The words that come out of your mouth really don't mean a whole lot. And so... He had to experience many things along the way, as you know. And as you know, if you've been in this uh, Christian love walk for a while, if you've been following Jesus, you have to learn a lot of things on the fly. Paul was no different. He had to learn things that, on the fly. He had to learn and understand that there's things that he had to go through he didn't, that he didn't get right away. I don't think he got a lot of this stuff right away. I think that he, he had qualified Paul was qualified to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Say all things. all things. And I believe everybody in this room, I believe that everybody who follows Jesus can get to that place where you can say, I can do all things through Christ. And you can say it with confidence and boldness and knowing that it's, it, you can accomplish it because of the strength of Christ working through you. And so we like to use this scripture pretty much for anything, you know, basically when things get going tough or when we need a quick fix or as a motivational speech just so it will change the attitudes of our hearts. And uh, lots of times the attitude of our heart, our heart is not right when we say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's just not there. It's just not right. And so... We want to use the scriptures a lot of time for convenience, for our convenience, rather than to use it for God's glory. Because we're going through a struggle. And all of a sudden, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But we're saying it so that we can get through a trial, so that we can get through a hardship without e and still not know Christ after all it is done. Like, I've done it myself. I don't know about you. Maybe you're, you haven't, but Paul was qualified to say it. He was qualified. He had, he, right from chapter 1, Paul is building on something that we can say, I am able to do all things through Christ who thinks in me. He was qualified. Paul was not presumptuous when he was saying that. He was not uh, doing the positive, positive motivational speech looking at the mirror trying to he wasn't he wasn't I am a winner I am a winner I am a, we were in Amway that's what they tell you go look in the mirror and say I am a winner I am a winner I am a winner and I still see the loser there <laughs> yeah I'm a winner I'm broke I'm bankrupt I'm got no money I'm just but I am a winner <laughs> Paul wasn't that way you know, he created us to win. Of course he wants us to win. He won. And he wants us to win. And so, if you look at this, this process of strengthening God's way, and this was not a theory. This was not a theory to Paul. It's like anyone else. He's, you know, we know 
the trials and the tribulations and everything that Paul went because we can read about it now. You know, I'm not so sure if I'd want a ministry like Paul's. Shipwrecked, beaten with rods, stoned, not doing pot or anything like that. He's just throwing stones at him, you know. He was clear-minded, you know, they left him for dead. How many times? Twice? Three times? You know, it was all stuff that he had to, he went through. The enemy was trying to stop what God was doing through him. And the enemy will try to stop what God is doing through you. And he'll try to get to your mind and say that, you know, you can say that, but you don't understand how to get there. And part of the reason we can say that and don't understand is we want to microwave it. We want to cut short. We want to get to the, I can do all things through Christ so that we can have a good name in the ministry for Jesus. Instead of having the gospel of the kingdom proclaimed so that people can know that there's a love, that there's a God who loves them immeasurably more than anything they could ever imagine. And so this, this whole thing is, is amazing. And, and first, or in chapter 1, 1 to 11, I'll start. Paul and Timothy, verse 1, slaves of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons. So to, to the saints and, and including the, I don't know why he says that, <laughs> including the overseers and the deacons. So guys, to me it looks like the overseers and the deacons got a lower position than the saints that are being, you're teaching. And think about this a little bit. The overseers and the teachers, you know, we always like to put them up, put us up on a pedestal, whoa, he's got this or that. But you know what, if you look at the most brilliant people in the world, the greatest engineers and all these people, that there are so many smart people out there in the world right now, how come you never hear who their professor was? How come you never hear who their professor was or whatever, you know, who, there was people that helped, helped them along the way to get where they were. If those people wouldn't have helped them along the way, like Bill Gates and all these, is that his name, Bill? No, uh, Bill Gates. And then who's the other guy? Job, Steve Jobs, okay, There's those guys, they got help along the way too. They just weren't so brilliant that they overpowered all their professors and everything. They had to learn, they got trained by people, but you never hear who the professors are. And I think in the kingdom of God, I, I, I think we put too much emphasis on the preachers and all the other leaders and all that stuff where the emphasis should be on the body of Christ and of course the emphasis should be on the head rather than on anybody, right? The head, Jesus Christ. His body working together, functioning together, getting somewhere. Why? Because Jesus is leading and guiding and teaching. And the teachers and the, you know, that we sing that song, more of you and less of us. But do we really mean it? Do we really mean it? And I, I believe, I, I, I want to work myself into a place where I'm not even noticeable in this place. That's why we're having a Releasing the Prophets conference. So I want to become not, not noticeable. But a part of the body, a part of the function, it needs to be there. And so, I, I wasn't going to talk about that, but I just noticed that including the overseers and deacons. You see, the, the, there's, no, there's no high and mighty in that. Everybody's at that same position. We're, we're supposed to be, you know, taking up our position. Whatever you are, your elbow, a wrist, they're all important in the body, right? Like I, I used an illustration that I'm not going to use here, but <laughs> in Saskatoon, so maybe someday, I don't know, because that was crazy, that was off the cuff, and I didn't think about it for one second. It just happened. And, and, but I, I talked about the arm a little bit, and I'll just say, like you, you, your bicep pulls your arm up, and your tricep takes it back down. If you don't have a tricep, you'd go like that, and your arm would be stuck forever. So you'd have one shot at it. 
Like, <laughs> you better you better make it good. If you're gonna do that, uh, if I move my arm one time, right? If I use use my arm one single time, then I'm done. I, I got no use in that ever again. Poof, because you got nothing to pull down. So you walk around like this, it's gonna be helpless, wouldn't it? Especially right now, I don't have the flexibility that I did when I was like 25 years old. This is about as far as I can bend right now. So I'd never be able to pick anything up off the floor. Because there's something wrong with the body. It's dysfunctional. And the body of Christ cannot be dysfunctional anymore. Everybody has to take up their position on who they are and what they're supposed to be doing. And then we will get somewhere. Say amen. Okay. <laughs> there we go. And so we, here he's, he's talking. He's talking about all the saints. Say all the saints. All the saints. You know, some of you are here, you're 85 years old or 86 years old, and then there's babies in here. And, and, but everybody's important along the way. Right? Amen? That's why, you know, everybody's important. When we come to worship, we should all be coming together with our hearts set on worshiping Jesus without agenda. Like we're coming here, we're just going to bring honor to the king as a body. Amen? And so, um, God is good. Grace, verse 2, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks. Now listen to the attitude of his heart here in this chapter as to why he can say, I can do all things through Christ. He's not saying he's a great, high and mighty God. He's saying, he's saying, listen, he says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you. Verse 4, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer. Praying in joy for my every prayer. Every prayer. I can do all things. That's why he could say I could do all things. Because he had this attitude. And what was his attitude? He was a Christ-like. He was full of Jesus. That's why he could do this stuff. And he's like, he's got all the weight of the world. Uh, really, he's got the, he's, he's a responsibility for the churches and all. The, he's got a tremendous amount of responsibility. Verse 5, because... And, and, and he's, he's, he's rejoicing. Why is he rejoicing? Because, verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I am sure of this, verse 6, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to think this way about you because I have you in my heart and you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the establishment of the gospel. For God is my witness how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And I pray this, that you lo your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment so that you can improve the things that are superior and be pure and blameless in the day of Christ and, and filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. See, when you listen to that, when you read that and you meditate on it, you just, feel, you, you just feel the love of God pouring out through him. He's in a prison for Pete's sakes. He's not sitting in a hotel in the Ramada Inn or in the spa in Musha. He's like full of joy in a prison where he's not allowed to go anywhere. How can he do that? See, that's why he could say, I can do all things through Christ because he lived it. <laughs> and Christ always showed himself faithful to Paul. And back to verse 3, he says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance. He always praying with, with joy for all of you in my every prayer. The people that he was in charge of he could feel, they could feel his passion. It radiated out of him. Amen? And it was because of the Lord's empowerment of him. And it's that submitting to the headship and to the lordship of Jesus so that Jesus can flow through him. 
hanging on to unforgiveness and bitterness and anger and rage and all that stuff is you saying, I am not going to allow God to flow through me. And so therefore, if you have that attitude of art, you don't have, you're not qualified to say, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. You are speaking something that's not true. <laughs> and it's not a pleasant place to be. I've been there. Hanging on to bitterness and unforgiveness and something that happened a long time ago. It's really, it really, and I did say, I would say, I can do all things through Christ, but I wasn't accomplishing anything. And, but you can feel the passion that Paul had in him. He was going somewhere in the book of, or the epistle or letter or whatever you want to call it, of Philippians. And I've seen people that operate like this and I feel a love growing in this place. I really do. Amen? I do. And I, when I really first experienced, when I first seen it in reality, I was a Christian for about eight years, I guess. No. No, just, just nine. Nine years when we went to Africa with Reinhardt. And I seen that first, firsthand. That was one of the things I watched as I watched, sat on a platform and watched Reinhardt minister the love that was being poured out through him. It was just like, it was radiating. You could feel it. You could feel the passion that he had for the people. It was amazing. But here's what else was amazing to me. I felt the passion radiating from the people back to him. There was no division there. It was an open heaven that was totally like, whoa. And then I think I began at the process of beginning to understand when the Lord spoke to me many years ago. He says, when you can walk in my love, you'll walk in my power. I begin to understand that concept then when I seen that. Did that start that day? No, it didn't. You know, you're preaching to a million and a half people in one service, 1.6 million in one service, the biggest one, and the smallest one was 500,000. Did that happen that day? No, it didn't happen that day. Did it happen? It started as a process when he started speaking to the one, to the two, to the three, to the four, to the five, and he was faithful with a little, and then God continually began to add the increase to him, and that love began to build and build and build and build and build. And if we as the people of God can begin to feel that love for one another, you know, that I'm not just saying for the pastor, I would like this, it's for everybody. Like the pastor and the love for one another, is, it's an amazing thing that can happen. And, and it was an amazing experience when I felt that. The people can feel when there's an attitude of gratitude, and the people can also feel when there's a attitude of familiarity. A lot of times us pastors we get a little frustrated because you can you you can there's a familiarity comes I've been here for five years just about now there's, there's at times you feel a familiarity but I found the solution to it though. I found out the reason that the people feel a familiarity is because I began to feel a familiarity first. Crazy. So I'd look in the mirror, go, oh, hello, wake up. Break off the familiarity and start to love people. Just love them. The way love, way, the way Christ loves us. You know, think about how he loves us. Think about the, the love that he pours out on us every single day. And think about all the boneheaded things that we've done over the years. <laughs> he chose to overlook that and continue to pour out love so we finally get it one day. 
Sometimes we got to go through some struggles and rough and, oh, you know, the thorns and the thistles and all that stuff. <laughs> we got into the thorns and thistles. It wasn't God who sent us there. We walked the wrong way and ended up in the thistle patch. That hurts. And the worst thing in southern Saskatchewan, when you fall down and there's cactuses, that's worse by far. Oh, my goodness. I, d I didn't know, like, we didn't have cactuses where I come from. You could roll down a hill. You can't do that here. <laughs> he saw. I remember this young fellow was with us. Uh, I'm not going to say his name. But we, w we climbed, it. We, for some reason, we decided to stop and climb this hill. On, uh, we're out by, what is that, St. Victor? We're out, you're old. Stomping grounds. We're all with St. Victor, and there's this hill that looks like a like a like a hat, and it didn't really look that steep until we climbed it. Right? It was steep. I went. I was like, I was going up like this, and and I put my hand down a couple times, and the thistles or the the thorn, the cactuses, they really hurt. And this young fellow that was with us, he decided to run right from the top to the bottom, and all I could do was pray for that boy, but he did not fall. I thought, that is the most coordinated kid I've ever seen in my life. If he would have had one slip all the way down, Cactus Jack. Wow. It's kind of like us. You know, we have one slip and we, we happen to be in the cactus patch. Did God lead us there? No, I don't think so. We just decided to go our own way for a little while. And it hurts and we pull out the cactuses out. But thank God he gives us another chance, right? And so, but this familiarity, you have to fight off familiarities. And pastors can be affected. And I want to talk to you pastors out there. You can be just as familiar with your congregation as your congregation is with you. And it started with you probably. So, forgive me for that statement, but it's true. So, so what was Paul thankful for? Verse 5 says, Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. It was in a partnership of encouragement, support, prayer, and suffering. That last part, nobody wants to hear that one, but it was a partnership of encouragement, support, prayer, and suffering. And they had a common goal. They had decided to follow Jesus without agenda. They decided to follow Jesus as a group without agenda. They decided to follow Jesus uh, through thick or thin together. We're going to get through this and we are going to become the body of Christ. The Ephesian church was, was known for this tightness and closeness. Or the Philippian church also. They, I mean, they were known for this tightness. And, and verse 6, now, now, now listen to this. Verse 6, he says, I'm sure of this. That he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He says, I'm sure of this. In the Amplified, it says, I, and I am convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue until the day of Jesus Christ, right up to the time of his return, developing that good work. Devel There's a key word, developing that good work and perfecting and bringing it to full completion in you. Amen? Amen? It's a development process. And he's so confident. And he, they had developed such a great godly character that Paul was convinced they were going to make it to the finish line. Paul was convinced through experience. He says, they've been this long. They send me gifts. I'm in prison. And they just, they're so confident. He's so confident that they're going to make it. He's convinced of it. And when you're convinced that somebody's going to make it, man, there's just something about that. There's just something like you, you just, you feel that. Like Shelly's always been an encourager to me. She's always said you can make it. Always. Never once did she come to me and pick out all the careful garbage. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, those replacement words for swear words, they mean the same thing. But anyway, 
So I'm trying to learn how to speak without cursing. Because those replaceable, but she'd never ever pulled that out of. She'd never pulled. She'd, 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 she'd never come up to me and say, "Terry, you know, if you could just get rid of this and get rid of that and get rid of this and get rid of that, you'd be a good husband." She'd never do that. She might have thought it, but she'd never say it. Come on, Bernie. We all think stuff like that. Come on. She's not Jesus, you know. So, but. She would never, ever nag at me for everything that was wrong with me. And when we got married, oh, you want to talk about issues. I had them all. But she never focused on them, ever. And I owe her my life for that, really. Because it was something she'd pull. She'd learn how to draw. Well, long before she came to Jesus, she learned how to draw. Pull out what's the best thing. Amen. She should teach stuff like that. Actually, she could write books and studies and stuff like that. Because my mother-in-law, on the other hand, wasn't so complimentary. <laughs> yeah. She, like, picked everything that I did wrong and... And uh, magnified it. Until I come to know Jesus and then she fell in love with me and then it was good. She liked me more than Shelly towards the end. And you know, <laughs> or for a while there and then things got a little rough again. But anyway. But it's that thing. And, and when with me, my nature, my old nature was, if you're going to nag at me, I'm just going to get worse. <laughs> It was, you, you spoke those things into existence for me. But it was like, really, it was, she never did that. And so I, I thank Shelly that she's always been like that. Me, on the other hand, I would pick everything out that she shouldn't be doing. Yeah. Took me a long time to figure that out. 29 years coming up pretty soon on the 11th. And taking her to Red Deer for the anniversary. So, But anyway, uh, um... <laughs> <laughs> you know, she's just about got, tra got me trained to put dishes in the dishwasher. Uh, yeah, I think about every once, every three, four times now I get to the dishwasher. I get it close. I'm starting to get it in now. It's every once in a while it's full of, full of uh, clean dishes. That's a moral dilemma to a man. We just don't know what to do with that. <laughs> what do you do with a dirty dish when it's full of clean dishes? Yeah, it's very hard. Put it in the sink. Yeah, yeah, put it in the sink. <laughs> but she's training. Justin, I'm trying to learn. Just we got a trainer in the house. He's pretty good. Justin is amazing. Yeah. yeah, he's trying to train us. He's not getting through very good, though. But anyway, we're from old school. I have no idea why I'm talking about this. <laughs> well, that's why. Because we just never, you know, Shelly just never pulled. But she never really, she's... She says, can you please take your dishes to the dishwasher? But once every two months, she would say that to me now. And uh, every now and then I remember. But so I'm getting there. And at least I'm thinking about it now. So it's a process. Pretty, pretty soon I'll be a good husband. Yeah. You see, there's an advantage when you come to know Jesus early in, in life. You, you, you just learn to be nice right from the beginning. So <laughs> I had some stuff. Okay. Verse 8. Or did I read seven? It is right for me to think this way about all of you. Okay, there we go. This is it. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because I have you in my heart and you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in, my, in the defense and the establishment of the gospel. Now you can begin to understand why Paul is, could say that I can do all things through Christ, Right? He says, because I have you in my heart and you are partners with me in grace, in, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the establishment of the gospel. That's what the partnership was they're walking for. They weren't walking, they weren't in this to get, to make a good name that they were building this great church and all this stuff. They were doing it for this very reason right now. To, um, in defense and establishment of the gospel. So he could walk in God's love, so therefore he could walk in God's power. For God is my witness, 
how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ. See, can we say that when we're away from one another? I do too. I, I do right now. When, I, when I'm away from you all for a while, I miss, and this like, really, I can't wait to get back home. I'm getting so much more of that right now. It's amazing. But do we miss one another the way that he's talking about? I miss you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. That's a bold statement right there. The affection of Christ Jesus. Wow. Uh, I just want, you know, the more I sing that song, the more of you and less of me. It's just, it's, it helps. And I pray that you, that your love will keep growing in knowledge and in every kind of discernment. And so he has this pure love for the people that he's overseeing. Verse 9. And... I pray this, that, that your love will keep on growing in the knowledge and every kind of and then 10, so that you can approve the things that are superior and can be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. You can improve those things. Verse 11, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So, you look at this, and your, your love is growing, your, and your love is growing, and it, it will keep you, keep you growing in knowledge and in every kind of discernment. So there's all this stuff that we can tap into. You know, the love is so strong that you can grow in knowledge and grow in discernment, begin to understand. I think Darcy you prayed one time that, you know, that we would discern things as soon as people would walk in here. We'd begin to discern it. So how do we do that? He says, I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and discernment, in every kind of discernment. Your love has to grow along with this. You're growing and, and you're doing it and you're, you want to see people set free by the power of God. As soon as they walk into this place, you want to walk, be able to walk up to them and bind that thing in the name of Jesus and declare life upon them. And you do it for because you love these people so much that you just want to see them set free. You put away every agenda that we might be carrying and just say, Lord Jesus, let us see people the way you see. I imagine Paul must have prayed like that. Let us see people the way that you see people. Let us minister, let us become ministers because Paul had seen Jesus in his glorified state. He wanted to be like that one. And he says that I may know him, that I may know Christ. And that I may know him, that I may know, that I may know him. He cried out from the depths of his heart. And I may know of the love of Christ and the fellowship of his sufferings. <laughs> it's really amazing. So we grow in these things and, 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 and so that you can improve the things that are superior. superior. Prove those things that are superior. The love of Christ, which passes all understanding when you're spiritually dead. But when you begin to understand the love of Christ, we can know the mind of Christ. We can have the mind of Christ. We can become that person because we are focusing so much on Jesus. I've been doing a 21 day fast from movies. I haven't watched a movie. I watched a football game, but I haven't watched a movie for 21 days. And I go home and I just don't turn the TV on. I've seen Sharon and them sometimes have movies going. I just look a little and walk away. But my mind seems to be getting clear. Could it be that movies aren't good for you? Could it be that I feel better too because I'm not having these worldly thoughts run through my head? Could it be that I can learn more about the affection and the love of Christ because I'm more into the Word and more with His people and more into conversation than going into a brain-dead state to sit on a couch to lose energy and get all the life sucked out of you so that you can't even think in the morning when you wake up? Could it be... That there's something to this. See, they had a lot of advantages back in those days. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have television. They didn't have all, that, all this stuff. The last night I, I, 
I, I, the, the last sign for the end of the age came when I signed up for Facebook. <laughs> it was crazy. I just about said, I'm out of this. I'm, uh, I had a hundred, before I went to bed last night, I had a hundred friends. <sighs> and I, then, I, then I woke up in the morning and, you know, I left, shut my phone off and there was like 45 emails that came out. My phone started going, ding, 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 ding. I thought, uh oh, I have lost it. I've lost it all. Like, I lost everything that I gained by not watching those movies. But I just decided I'm just going to put declarations on there and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to look at what anybody has to say. This is about Jesus. And, and it's, I, I, I just couldn't get over that. How fast people could find out about you. It's crazy. <laughs> So I'm going to make sure that I'm, I'm going to be accountable. I'm going to put everything, I'm going to just pump the gospel through that every day. <laughs> Instead of watching the movie, I'm going to go to Facebook and start declaring things over our world and over our, over our province, over our nation. They're going to be so sick of me on Facebook, they're going to want to delete me off their... You know. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to give life through it. Well, you know, that's about as far as I can get. I'm 12 verses through this four chapters today. 13, I can do all things through Christ. And I'm, I'm going to carry, carry on from there. But that fruit of righteousness, that love and the mercy of God. Becoming Christ-like. Praying, praying in just, just before you go to bed at night. Oh, Jesus, so I could wake up with the mind of Christ. I don't even have those, I don't, when I go to bed now, I just have pure thoughts. Just from a simple, simple act that really, and I got challenged from a couple of young guys, you know, about the movies and stuff like that. You guys can do that, you know. We can challenge one another and, and push one another to go to greatness because do we want to see this? Do we want to get to the place where we can say, I can actually do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me? Can we get to this position in our lives where we, it, no matter what, in death or life, like Paul goes on later on in this chapter, and I'll go to that next week. Paul goes on to say, in death or life, I'm going to glorify God. It just doesn't matter. We're going to go after Jesus. We're going to declare the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And we're going to become the people of God. And we, we, I want everybody along with me, all of us, to say it in unison someday. Like all of us, we can just shout through the whole town and just raise up our voice and say, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. And mean it. Instead of having a positive motivational speech at that moment of our lives. Say it, mean it, believe it. Become the people of God that, that this community needs to know and see. And they're only going to come to know Jesus by our declaration of how we live our lives. Like who would want to come into a, a, a church that's full of fighting and infighting and bitterness and anger and all that stuff? Who would want that? I never was too much too fond of it. I stuck around just because I knew that we had to become part of the we had to become part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Every time we run away, we become part of the problem. We don't become part of the solution. Every time we get a critical spirit in our hearts and our minds or whatever, we become part of the problem, not part of the solution. Paul here, I'm sure he had to deal with all kinds of negative situations through this whole thing and with the whole Philippian church. I'm sure he had to. He had to deal with all kinds of situations, but yet he talked about, I love you so much. I miss you so much. I miss you with Christ's affection. I wish I could be with you every single day, but I can't. And I just love being around you. And I knew there was things going on. There had to be because he was dealing with people. People are people. Nothing new under the sun. Nothing. <laughs> you know, it's really. They had the power of the gospel, but they still had a lot of problems. Paul had guys that were backstabbing him and, you know, he, one time Paul was left by himself. He had nobody left. Everybody left him. But what come out of his mouth? Mercy and grace and truth. And, 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 and so the next group of people would come and say, oh, yes, we fell in love with Paul. Become the people of God. 
Amen. And I know there's people in this room that you've felt that. You've felt that loneliness. You've felt what it's like to be alone when nobody would listen to you. Nobody wanted to hear you. Nobody wanted to be a part of your life. But somehow, the Spirit of God creeps in and just loves, just starts overtaking you and you begin to pray and intercede and set, set your heart on the things of God things you're seated with Christ in heavenly places you begin to you begin to change your whole thought process you get a smile on your face you begin to love one another and grow together in the things of Jesus people forgive start forgiving one another I really believe in the next 18 months there is going to be a real um, recon movement of reconciliation in the Assiniboia area for people. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that used to serve Jesus in this community from all denominations that don't have nothing to do. I believe that the Lord Jesus is about to set in the motion, the spirit of reconciliation, and there's going to be the love of Christ is going to be poured out on all denominations. Amen? And and there's gonna, we're going to drop our, we're just going to drop a lot of the stuff and we're just going to start loving one another and it's going to be amazing. It's going to be fun. That is going to be fun. Amen. <laughs> That's going to be fun. We're going to put down our swords. I mean the real swords. Pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, <laughs> and, and quit put, put the daggers in one another's back. The time's coming and it's here. Amen. So that's recorded, so... Let it be done. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Took a risk there. But that's risk. Risk. It's risky serving Jesus. Let's stand to our feet. And, and, and we're, this is just part one. I got through a few verses there. And we're going to carry on next, next week with He Strengthens Me. How many want Jesus to strengthen? Yes. Amen? Yes. Jesus tonight, strengthen us. By the power of your Holy Spirit working in us, Lord God. Let us put down everything that hinders us. Just right now, think of things. An attitude of the heart that may be holding you back right now from going deeper into the things of God. Let's try to disconnect. With Jesus. And I'm not saying it at this in the spirit of, like that you should feel guilty. No, it's, it's say, say if you have a problem with your car, it's got a, a bad, they, do they, they don't even have carburetors anymore, but say it's got a, a bad starter. Instead of feeling bad about get, having a bad starter, you just go out and get another one and put it on, right? Buy it, take it to the service, whatever you got to do, get it done, right? Because no matter how much you cry about it, that bad starter is never going to get better until you buy a new one and put it in, right? So you just make a decision, I'm going to change it. So what you, we got to do tonight is make a decision that we're going to change the attitudes of our hearts. Amen? Amen. I was supposed to announce this about two weeks ago. Well, I, I forgot all about it again. But the 21-day fast from something. What, what could it be? This thing with the movies is really working good. I think I'm going to carry on with that one. But what, what is it? Could it be an attitude? Could it be a, a th negative thinking, negative words coming out of your mouth, how we speak to one another? Criticism towards our governments. Something maybe that could change there. Whatever it is. Whatever really gets under your skin. Just take that to the altar and leave it on there tonight. Let's just play something. Some keyboard, give me something. I need to hear God.
know, just, just in that attitude, just begin to connect with Jesus. And he'll remove that, whatever that is, that needs to go right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I, I pray right now for our hearts to be pure before you, Lord God. I just pray that out of the attitude of our heart, life would come, Lord. Life would come. Life would flow. Songs would begin to flow. Prayer and intercession would rise up in the house of God. That this truly would become a house of prayer in the name of Jesus. Just lift up your voices to him right now. Just start, even in the spirit. Just pray in the spirit. If you can't think of nothing to say, just pray in the spirit. What is it that needs to be broke off here today in the name of Jesus? We break off the spirit of familiarity right now. Jesus, I repent of that spirit of familiarity right now in the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I declare life. I declare that the prayer life of the saints would begin to ignite right now in the name of Jesus. The, our passion for prayer would be on the increase right now in the name of Jesus. And in the name of Jesus, Father, teach us to pray. Oh, Lord, teach us to pray. We cry out to you, the living God. Right now, in the name of Jesus. Oh. There's a river. There's a cleansing stream that's coming. There's a cleansing stream that's coming and it will cleanse away all impurities. All evils will begin to melt away from our thought process. All evil thoughts would go in the name of Jesus. We cry out right now into the living God right now in the name of Jesus. We just declare that restoration to take place in our hearts and our minds right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I just had a thought. Uh, we're going to keep worshiping. Just don't stop. Just keep going the same place you were. Uh, once you start worshiping, whatever things are hindering the body of Christ, we want to break that off tonight. But not just stop there. The things that are hindering, say, say complaining. Complaining is is hindering the body of Christ because I can do all things, you know, do all things without complaining, without murmuring. But then it goes on to say that we should do, all, that edify, only speak things that are edification. So we break off, we break off complaining and we rise up, we lift up the spirit of, of edification upon, we declare edification that the body of Jesus Christ would start to edify rather than to criticize in the name of Jesus. So whatever we can do, if we start with a negative, we finish with a positive. I know that's hard. You might have to think about this for a day or two even, or a week. But if somebody's got something tonight, we'll worship. Let's go into worship right now, and we'll start doing that. Okay? So I'm going to do that with what I thought of right now. In the name of Jesus, I break up the spirit of complaining. I break it off and I command it to cease right now over the body of Christ. And Father, I pray for the spirit of edification to rise up on the body of Christ that we would begin to speak words of life in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Let's work.